Hello all, in our previous video we looked at the uh, chronic adaptions made by the cardiovascular system as a result of aerobic training. Um, at the end of this particular video I'll highlight a couple of areas that maybe I rushed through in the previous video due to a lack of time because I think we can get through the, uh, the chronic adaptions to the respiratory system made by aerobic training much faster. Now, with the, uh, the circulatory system or the cardiovascular system, obviously that's the, the important aspect of being able to transport oxygen and nutrients toward the working muscles as well as getting rid of those waste products so that they can be you know, addressed and, and allow us um, to perform really, really well and for them not to limit our performance. So the circulatory system certainly plays a very important role. The respiratory system which we're looking at today is, is all about the ability of the, the body to actually intake the oxygen and not only intake it but then also allow that intake and oxygen to be put into the bloodstream so it can be transported to those working muscles. It's no good bringing in lots of oxygen if you can't then put it into the bloodstream so it can be transported across to those working muscles. And, and likewise, it's, it's no, no good bringing all those waste products like carbon dioxide to the lung tissue if it can't actually be then removed via the, via the breathing or the respiratory system. So let's have a look at our PowerPoint to start us off. And as I said, the, the respiratory system is pretty straightforward. You can see here we've got four points on the PowerPoint. We've got an increase in lung and vital capacity, which is essentially we can breathe in more and we can breathe out more. All right? So vital capacity is essentially your, your, your lung volume in a lot of ways. Tidal volume is how much you're breathing in and out per breath. All right? So it's a bit different. It's, it's not that forced breathing like vital capacity is where you're trying to empty your lungs completely. So your tidal volume is going to increase. So that means that as you're running along, you're breathing in more than you normally would, than what you previously did. All right? So that means that when it comes to how many breaths you need to do, so your respiratory rate, it might decrease if you're going at a, a sub max level or a resting level in a similar way um, to how we looked at uh, cardiac output and stroke volume and heart rate. Heart rate was locked in, stroke volume can increase therefore our, our heart rate decreases to, to achieve the same amount of cardiac output. It's the same situation here with our respiratory system. Our um, ventilation is going to be um, changing all the time depending on the intensity of the activity. Our respiratory rate will be changing all the time as a result of the intensity activity and so will our tidal volume. But because our tidal volume is, is higher than it previously was, it means that to achieve the same level of ventilation, we don't need to breathe as often. And that's why you see respiratory rate coming down at rest and also coming down at submax level. So where previously you might have had to have breathed, let's say, 15 times a minute as you were running at 10k an hour, now because your tidal volume has increased, you're only breathing 12 times. All right, so you can see there that we've had a, a decrease in our respiratory rate. Of course, your respiratory rate will, will go to its highest possible point when it's at it, and when you're working at your maximal levels. As for ventilation, you see that it goes down at submax levels, but it increases at maximum intensity and it's unchanged at rest. And this can be quite confusing for some people. So let's have a look at this graph here where I've got it a little bit more blown up. At rest, you can see the blue line and the green line are dead level. All right, there's no difference there. But our untrained athlete, their rate of ventilation increases at a much greater rate. You can see that, that that green line is much steeper, indicating that their ventilation is increasing faster. And then tops out here at about 140 litres per minute. It tops out there because that's the maximum amount that that particular person can breathe in each minute. For our trained athlete, even though the exercise intensity is the same, they are tracking or increasing their ventilation at a much lower rate. You can see that that line there isn't nearly as steep. This is indicating that this athlete here is able to utilize the oxygen in their system much more effectively. That is, they can get more energy from the same amount of oxygen. And that you know, is essentially what efficiency is all about. And so when we combine not just the respiratory adaptions, but also the circulatory adaptions and also the muscular adaptions, which we'll go through in the next video, this is what enhances our ability to use oxygen more effectively or more efficiently. So this athlete here would be breathing far faster and far deeper than this athlete here, even though they're jogging along together. Or, and, and that sort of thing, so hopefully that makes sense. But you can see here that because this athlete is trained, they keep going to a much higher intensity, or not intensity, but higher speed of exercise. All right? Here, this athlete would be feeling like they're going at 100%. And the same with this athlete. They'd feel like they're going at 100% at this point as well. The difference being 
what is the speed that they need to go at to achieve 100%. And that's ultimately what we're looking for as a result of training. We're looking to improve that maximum speed that we can go at. Whether it's the maximum speed that we can go at anaerobically using the ATP CP system with some speed training or whether it be the maximum speed that we can go at using our aerobic system and not going beyond our lactate inflection point. All right? They're both really, really important numbers and, and hopefully that makes sense to us. If we move on to our next slide, we've got alveolar capillary surface area, an increase in that, an increase in pulmonary diffusion and an increase in aerobic capacity or oxygen uptake. So. Let's have a look at some graphs really, really simply and hopefully we can make some sense of things. This is a, a really, really simple um, diagram of, of the, the structures within our lungs. It's, it's not, our, our lung I guess is not a, a smooth bag that, that air flows into. It's actually a, a bag full of tiny little um, sacs at the end of all the branches of our lungs. As we do more aerobic training, our body develops more of these little sacs here called alveolar ducts and alveolar sacs. By increasing the amount of sacs, it increases the amount of surface area within the lungs for the diffusion of oxygen to take place into the blood vessels. You can see the, the blue and red here on the, on the alveoli um, ducts and sacs. They're blood vessels. And so what's going to happen is if we can get more of these ducts and sacs being produced at the end of our lung tissue, well then we're also going to grow blood vessels over the top of those, those ducts and sacs, which is going to increase our ability to extract oxygen from the air that we breathe in and diffuse it into our bloodstream so it can be transported to working muscles. So hopefully this, this next graph here might give us a better indication of how it all works. So what happens is we get a, a flow of blood that is really, really low in oxygen concentration into the lung tissue. And that's indicated here by the blue. As it flows across the alveolar duct and sac, sac we can see that the, the oxygen is being diffused into it and we're getting a change of colour from blue to a purpley colour and finally to a nice bright red colour, which indicates that the blood has been oxygenated. The more capillaries we have over the top of the alveolar, the greater the opportunity for diffusion to take place. So that means we can actually push more oxygen into the blood. So, you know, providing we have red blood cells, of course, which contain the haemoglobin, which carries the, the oxygen. So if you've got lots of red blood cells and you've got lots of alveoli, um, well, then you're going to be able to absorb and diffuse lots of oxygen into the bloodstream. And conversely, you'll be able to drop off lots of carbon dioxide into the alveoli so it can be breathed out. I'm hoping that that makes sense. Um, pulmonary diffusion sort of goes hand in hand. So pulmonary diffusion is the diffusion taking place in the lungs and as we've talked about, if we have more capillaries, if we have more of these circles in our lungs, well then we're going to have a greater opportunity for pulmonary diffusion to take place, which is the movement of oxygen from the, the lung tissue, the alveolar, into the capillaries. All right. So again, that oxygen moves into the haemoglobin, which is within the red blood cells. So red blood cells are really important. Um, and finally, aerobic capacity. Well, our aerobic capacity is going to increase as a result of increasing the amount of oxygen that's going into our bloodstream. If we can deliver more oxygen per milliliter of blood to our um, working muscles, well then that's going to allow our um, working muscles to hopefully take on more oxygen. Obviously, there, there needs to be changes within the muscle tissue as well, and we'll go in through that in our next video, things like increases in myoglobin and increases in mitochondria to allow the, the oxygen to be transported within the muscle cell and to then be used, used in the aerobic system. But really, that, uh, those things all combined together are going to see an increase in aerobic capacity. So aerobic capacity is simply how much energy can we produce using, using the aerobic energy system. And if we're getting more oxygen into the system, it, it makes very, very good sense that our aerobic system should also, sorry, our aerobic capacity should also increase. Um, as I said, we, I just wanted to backtrack on a couple of things that I went through in the previous video where I think I maybe rushed things a little bit quickly because I was running out of time. As I talked about, hopefully with the blood vessels, I did a horrible diagram using um, the MCG as an example. Um, art certainly not my strong point, but hopefully you get the idea of, of that being, and I, I will unfortunately go back to it. If we only have one entry into the G, it's going to take a hell of a long time to fill the place up. But obviously, for all of us who've been to the MCG, which should be most of us, if not all of us, and if you haven't, well, you really should go, is 
the more entries you have, the quicker it can fill up. In the same way with our working muscles, if we have more capillaries feeding blood into those muscles, well then we can deliver oxygen at a faster rate. If we only have one capillary going into the working muscle, it's going to take a long time to deliver oxygen to all the working muscle cells. So obviously if we have more of them, we're going to work better and that is one of the chronic adaptions, an increase in capillarization, increase in blood vessels going into the working muscle and not just the working muscles but also the heart muscle itself. Um, we also get a better redistribution of blood flow. We are better able to limit the amount of blood going to unnecessary areas, maybe your digestive system and those sorts of things in those areas of the body that aren't really utilised during physical activity so that more blood can be dedicated to the working muscles and not just the working muscles but also areas like the skin to really enhance um, heat management so that we don't overheat and obviously if we overheat too much well then we'll sweat too much and then we'll suffer dehydration that's going to really limit our performance so if we can manage our heat better and limit the amount of sweating that we have to do um, well then that's going to only improve our performance particularly in long endurance events where you know your hydration is particularly important and those of us who who don't realize that when we do sweat too much we then start to lose blood volume which affects our plasma and then obviously affects how well blood flows around our body and that's going to limit our ability to transport oxygen to our working muscles so hydration is incredibly important blood volume um, Blood volume is simply an increase not only in red blood cells as a result of aerobic training, the red blood cells and the haemoglobin in the red blood cells being responsible for carrying the oxygen in the blood, but also an increase in the amount of plasma in the blood. So we might go from having 8 litres of blood in our body to having 9 litres of blood in our body, which is only going to enhance our performance because if we can have more blood, well then we have more blood that we can dedicate towards our skin um, to manage with uh, heat, uh, manage heat and that sort of thing, we can have more blood then to also send to our working muscles. So it, we get better at, at, at or the, the need to distribute effectively, I guess, is lessened. Or if it is, is, it, is effective, well, then we're going to be able to deliver more oxygen um, simply by the fact that if we're sending of our eight litres of blood, one litre to the skin and seven litres to the working muscles, that's great. But if we can have nine litres and send eight litres to the working muscles and one litre to the skin, well, if we've got eight litres going to the to the muscles that can only be better than sending seven liters to the muscles so hopefully that makes sense um, as I said plasma levels and, and red blood cell also increase and they increase at about pretty similar rates so your red blood cell count as a percentage is going to stay pretty similar we should know that red blood cells should make up about 45 percent of our blood in, in males and about 42 percent in females so in, if you're doing lots of aerobic training, that red blood cell percentage is still going to stay consistent. But obviously, if we've got more blood, we're going to have more red blood cells in total number, but the percentage stays the same. And so in that previous video, I mentioned this concept of a blood passport for international athletes in endurance events. And the idea there is that an athlete, once they become professional and start competing in these events, a blood sample is taken from them. And then that initial blood sample is then compared um, whenever they are drug tested. So rather than looking for drugs in their system, we're looking for changes in their um, blood percentages. And obviously if, they, if there are changes beyond what the doctors deem normal, then they can safely assume that the athlete has taken something that's illegal to make those changes happen because naturally they just shouldn't happen. Um, obviously, we've got an increase in red blood cells. We're going to have an increase in haemoglobin. Haemoglobin is a, a is a substance found within our red blood cells. So, if one increases, the other has to increase. That's just logical. And finally, myoglobin is essentially the same as haemoglobin, but within the muscle tissue. So, haemoglobin is within the red blood cells. Once the red blood cell takes the oxygen to the muscle, uh, the haemoglobin can do very little other than hand the the oxygen molecules over to the muscle cell. Once it's once the oxygen's in the muscle cell, it's transported about the muscle cell via this substance called myoglobin. So if we're going to get an increase in haemoglobin, which is going to deliver more oxygen to the muscles, well it makes good sense to have uh, more myoglobin there to then take hold of that oxygen that's been delivered and allow it to be transported quickly and effectively through the working muscle. Alright, so Otherwise, you get a big backlog or unfortunately, what would happen is we're getting oxygen that's being delivered and then unfortunately not being taken by the muscles and, and transported back to the lungs, which would be um, not a terrible thing, but a real waste of effort and energy. All right, so hopefully those things all make sense to us all. 
um, and yeah, we can look forward to hopefully another video in the coming days in regards to the uh, chronic adaptions of the muscle tissue, both aerobically and anaerobically. Bye.